Now we had it. talking about our stewardship campaign. So you all know that's coming up in November. Um, the 24th to the 27th, I'm gonna be in Seattle visiting my oldest daughter. She's been pestering me to come visit, so I'm gonna go see her there. And Gail Gary will be preaching that Sunday. On the 28th, we have our Barney Crossy sing-along, and on the 30th, so Wednesday night, is the Trunk and Treat at Town Hall. Um, who is Sam's not here. But anyway, yeah, they're gonna, we're going to have Brian's truck out there and we're going to hand out um, goodies and not just candy, but other kinds of things for kids, trinkets and stuff like that. Are there other announcements? Uh, maybe something about the roast beef supper? Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody who helped out last night. We took in... We took in $982. The cost of putting in an arm of stores, $72.54, so we ended up with a 509.45 cent profit. All right, thank you. And I also have one pound pack of roast beef for $6 if anybody's interested in seeing it out in the fellowship hall. We also downstairs, um, at council meeting last Sunday, we voted to um, get aprons for everybody who works at any of the church events. So uh, I have a sign-up sheet downstairs if you would like to contribute toward the cost of them, just sign your, your name on that sheet. It's on one of the tables downstairs in the book where the aprons are uh, pictured is there. It's going to be like the red apron, but it's going to be the blue, the royal blue one, and it will have uh, the name of our church and the United Methodist symbol on the apron. We will leave the aprons here at the church so that anybody who comes can wear one, like for our yard sales, our Christmas fair, our roast beef suppers, and things like that. So, um, like I said, the sign-up sheet's downstairs if you would like to buy one, help the church uh, have a lot of aprons to, available, that'd be great. Any other announcements? All right, what about joys and concerns? Are there any, uh, uh, yes? Uh, Last night, my, my nephew, Eddie, came to the, the roast beef supper, and uh, I asked him where I found up on his wife, and he said, oh, she just came out of the hospital. Eddie's legally blind. Oh. Um, he has COPD, and it's a non mm. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen to him. I think they're going to have to move back to be with that family, you know, their children. So, so Anne's nephew Eddie came last night uh, to the roast beef supper, and his wife has been in the hospital with COPD, and he is legally blind, and they may have to move to Connecticut. So it's it's Eddie and what's his wife's name? Welch. W-E-L-C. Oh, that's the last name, Welch. And what's his wife's name? Paulette. Paula. Paulette. Paulette. Okay. We'll keep them in our prayers. Cheryl? Uh, just for those of you who have been in this church for a while, Bob Smalley, Bob and Nancy used to go here, Bob passed away on Tuesday. Peacefully in his sleep, he was 95. Mm. So for the family of Bob Smalley, anyone else? Um, I just like some prayers. There's a lot going on in my life right now, my husband's, um, and I just like some positive prayers. All right, prayers to support suits. Okay.
Okay, if there's nothing else, let's turn to the front of our bulletins then and begin our worship. When we are lonely and lost, when we are angry and frustrated, when we are sorrowful and broken, Jesus finds out our wounds with his healing love. Come, let us worship the one who cares so abundantly for us. Amen. Our opening hymn uh, was translated by a member of the, new, the Southern New England Conference when I began ministry, D.T. Niles. He was a wonderful man from India and a district superintendent. And uh, he translated the words to these songs. It's a beautiful song uh, about refuge that we can find in Jesus. Serenam, Serenam. For the healing love you have offered to us, for the patience you have with us, for your presence that will never fail, we give you thanks, O oh Lord. We pray that you would bring our hearts and spirits to you, that we may grow in our faith and our service to you by serving others. This we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And a little bit of introduction to the first scripture reading, which is 2 Timothy 8-15. Suffering hardship while imprisoned for their faith had become a source of encouragement and even joy for Paul and other New Testament authors. Nothing could stop the good news from being proclaimed. It was the resurrection of Christ. which really gave Paul such a distinctive attitude to his suffering. This ultimately redemptive act of God would bring about the salvation of all who believe. This was the bedrock of their faith, their one good hope for salvation in a hostile world. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel for which I suffer hardship, even to point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. The saying is true, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithfulness, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are too avoiding wrangling over words, which does no good but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by Him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. May God bless the reading of Timothy 2. I'd like to invite the children to come up. morning. How are you today? Good. All right. I don't know whether you have any traditions in your home, but we do have traditions here in the church. Do you know what a tradition is, first of all? It's something you usually do. That's right. Can you think of other things that might be tradition? Some a specific thing, now that you know what a tradition is, something is customary to do. What do we do in church that's a tradition? Anybody? Anybody? What? Pray. Pray. That's a tradition. We pray. What else do we do in church? We sing hymns, right? You've got to have the children's time. We have children's time. That's a tradition to have children's time. Yes. What about in your home? Do you have specific traditions in your home? Something that you do maybe every Christmas or every Sunday or every week, you know? Do you open presents on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning? Christmas morning, so that's your, your tradition is to open them on Christmas morning. Right? One Christmas, one present on Christmas Eve, okay. Can you think of another tradition? Every Sunday we have waffles. Every Sunday we have waffles. You know what? When I was growing up, that was tradition in my home. Every Sunday night, my grandpa would pick pancakes. So we would have pancakes for supper every Sunday night. Beans on Saturday. You had it on a Saturday, huh? Beans. Beans. Beans on Saturday for some of you. I didn't grow up in New England, so it's different. Well, there are other kinds of traditions that we have. 
One of the traditions in my home was also to say prayers every night before we went to sleep. And we also had to memorize the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm, which is the words that begin, the Lord is my shepherd. Some of you may have heard those words before. So that was a tradition in my home besides uh, just saying prayers for bedtime. Um, we also played board games on Sunday afternoon because we weren't allowed to have TV. So I didn't have TV until I got in college. <laughs> so um, that was another tradition on the Sunday afternoon. We either visited the people or we played board games like uh, Chinese checkers or checkers or something like that, Pachisi. Well, there are traditions that can be very important for us. And one of the things that we do here in the church besides singing hymns and prayers is we have a tradition of a roast beef supper, which we had last night too. Traditions can be very meaningful for us, and some of the hymns we sing are very old, they're traditional hymns. Some of them are new, that we sang this morning, it's a newer kind of hymn for you. Um, in the scriptures, there was an old pastor named St. Paul, or Paul, who wrote to Timothy, which is where we read from the Bible this morning, with Sue read from Timothy, and Timothy was a young man, and Paul was saying he needed to pass on the traditions to him. And so I have here something that I want you to begin praying every night before you go to bed. So take one of these little scrolls and then open it. And then we're all going to read this prayer together because this can start a new tradition for you. This is a prayer in the tradition of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So open your little prayers. And since I am the older Christian and you are the young Christians, I'm passing on this tradition to you. All right, can we read this together? All right. Dear Lord, let's say it really loud, okay? Dear Lord, I thank you for the day you gave me. I don't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop. What's the next line say? Thank you for watching over me. Okay, what's the next line say? For to get all the wrong I have done today. Forgive all the wrong I have done today. How about you read the next line? And help me forgive all who have done wrong to me. Okay, let's so start back over here. Take good care of my family and all my loved ones. All right, and you can be. Let's all read the last line together. Let me sleep in peace in your tender care. Amen. All right, thank you. You may go to your class now. And, and remember, take those home and say those every night before you go to sleep. Wideness in God's mercy, number 121.
remain standing for the gospel, which is taken from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. And then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the God. Lord, thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us be in prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As you probably know, during Bible times, leprosy was a much feared disease. Those afflicted would live in leper colonies and you would see people with missing fingers or missing portions of noses and ears, people covered with white or gray spots on their skin, and people with desperation written all over their faces. The life of a leper was miserable. Not only did they suffer from the disease itself, which could be horribly disfiguring, they were treated as outcasts, experiencing horrible isolation and loneliness. They were often hungry for fellowship and friendship, even to be treated as a human being and not as an animal in the streets. Because people were so afraid of the disease, lepers were required to stand far away from other people. If they were windward of a healthy person, the leper had to stand at least 50 yards away, cover their upper lips, and cry out, unclean, unclean. Thank goodness that in our time, we know that leprosy is a chronic, but only mildly contagious disease caused by bacteria and it's usually treated effectively, and there's no need for isolation. So in our Gospel reading this morning, we hear that Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. He's traveling in the area between Samaria and Galilee. And these ten lepers saw Jesus. They may have heard of him before because they know his name, and somewhere in their inner being, so maybe a, a, a hope wells up. And keeping their distance, they call out to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And he does. Miracle of miracles, he does have mercy. Jesus does not touch them as he had done with other lepers he has healed. He does not pray over them. He does not even declare them to be healed. He simply says, go and show yourself to the priests. For a moment, they must have been stunned and speechless, but the implication was clear. There was only one reason for showing themselves to the priest. It was to satisfy the requirement of the Levitical ritual cleansing ceremony. They were to be declared clean and healed, and that meant they would be able to return to society and to normal lives. And so, they began their journey to the priest. And I think it took faith to do that because they still weren't healed yet. But they believed Jesus and on their way the marks of leprosy left their body. They were healed. No longer would they be regarded as physical and social outcasts because Jesus dared to heal this group of lepers hurting as broken and hurting people in need of healing and compassion and understanding. He also was giving them the dignity of human, being a human being. 
a normal human being, not an outcast. Because in Jesus' eyes, no one is an outcast. No one is beyond redemption. Because this is the same Jesus who began his ministry, if you recall, by reading from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and lepers were certainly oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord. Well, they're on their way, and one of them, a Samaritan, realizes that the hand of God has touched his life, that Jesus has accepted him, just the same as he had accepted the other nine, before they were healed. And I can imagine him standing in the road, transfixed as he realizes his leprosy is gone. He's healed. Overwhelming joy and gratitude grabs hold of him and eagerly he runs back to the place where he had met Jesus and falls at his feet in humble gratitude. We are not told what words he used to give thanks but we can be sure he was pouring out a lot of words of praise and wonder, joyful wonder. And Jesus responds to the leper's praise with questions. Were not ten made clean? Where are the other nine? Was this foreigner the only one to return and give praise to God? The questions are left hanging in the air for all to hear. Jesus doesn't expect an answer from the Samaritan himself. The questions are for all of us. For his listeners, the disciples, the people in the crowds, and for us here today. And then Jesus addresses the Samaritan and he dresses up. He says, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Now this may seem like a curious thing to say since we are told that all, the, all ten lepers were healed on the way. So they must have had some measure of faith to do what Jesus told them to do, to show themselves to a priest. Most translations um, of the words get up and go your way. Your faith has made you well. It's easy to think that having faith is the key to experiencing God's grace. But in this, sec in this section here, nothing is farther from the truth. In his commentary on Luke and the interpretation series, Fred Cranach points out that the verb translated made well that word is translated in two words. Made well is the same word translated to mean to be saved or to be made whole. In other words, Jesus is saying your faith has made you whole or your faith has saved you. The inference is 10 lepers were physically healed, but only one was saved. Only one was made whole. A truly whole human person relates to God's will in more than mere obedience, though obedience is the beginning of faith. A truly whole person has a faith characterized by joy, reverence, and praise, as well as obedience. Like the lepers on that road to Jerusalem long ago, our world is crying out for mercy for healing, for salvation, for wholeness. Because we live in a broken world. God's kingdom on earth is not yet. Some of us live broken lives. The lives of some people in our world are broken by violence who long for peace and safety. Some people in our world are broken by poverty and oppression, longing for the basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. Some people experience broken health or broken bodies and long to be healthy again. Some people have broken marriages and broken hearts, broken families, and long for meaningful relationships. Some people's lives are broken by addictions 
and long for freedom from the prisons that enslave them. And when we are feeling broken, whether we are sick, lonely, frustrated, grief-stricken, or isolated, in our brokenness, we cry out, in a sense, serenam, or refuge. We cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Because Jesus can feel like he's far away from us, that we can't reach him for a variety of reasons. And I always like to answer that question is, guess who moved? Jesus doesn't move. God doesn't move. We move away sometimes. Maybe we feel like we can't get close to Jesus because of an argument we had with our spouse, our son, or our daughter, or, some, or with someone else. Maybe we feel guilty and, and far away from Jesus because of something in our past, something that we can't let go of. Maybe we feel like crying, Jesus, have mercy on us, because we are so busy doing other things that we haven't time to enrich our spiritual life, because we haven't taken the time to, to pray and meditate or read the Bible. Maybe we want to feel close to Jesus, but circumstances have put distance between us and Jesus. Circumstances such as the death of a loved one, illness, or an accident that has caused hardship. Maybe financial worries have kept us apart from Jesus. Whatever the reason, we cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. For us New England rule-keeping uptight church Christians, this story is not a simple, sweet little story. The question that haunts us is, where are the other nine? They have obeyed Jesus' command to show themselves to the priest. They are now well, and in a sense, their story has a happy ending. But they have no idea what they have missed. If they ever encounter their former companion, the Samaritan, he can tell them what is lacking in their lives. He can tell them about a newfound freedom which lives not by the strict fulfilling of rules, but by, but by going beyond obedience to joyful gratitude. He can tell them that while their bodies are cured, their spirit can only be made whole through praise and worship and gratitude to God. So let us ask ourselves, are we like the nine who ignored the source and possibility of wholeness? I assume that all of us at one time or another has experienced healing, healing from injury or illness or an emotional problem, or perhaps we've experienced healing in a relationship. Perhaps we have one of the lucky ones who feel that everything has fallen into place and life is wonderful, that God has answered your prayers. Perhaps all of the above is true, but is that enough to satisfy your soul, your spirit? Where is the exuberant praise, the extravagant gratitude, the wild, joyful freedom, the willingness to go beyond what is required? Do we regularly return to the source of our blessing and say thanks? I confess I'm just as guilty as you all, so I don't feel like I'm scolding you. I'm scolding myself, too. Because the good news is that Jesus has compassion on us, just as he had compassion on those ten lepers. This Jesus, the Christ, has come into our midst and promises us all that we will be made whole. Because God's kingdom does come in little pockets of the world. You can see where everybody is living like God's kingdom has come. But it's not yet complete. When we return home from this worship, the struggles, the burdens, the difficulties will still be there. Whatever has made us feel away, far away from God and in need of mercy, the fears and the frustrations, the loneliness, the weariness, those problems will still be there. We are like lepers on the way to the priest. 
with the promise of healing and hope in our hearts. And it's that promise and hope that keeps us going. Despite all our problems, we believe in Christ's promises of wholeness. Through the grace of God, we can experience healing and salvation or wholeness. We can be made whole. The Samaritan was made whole because he saw more than healed flesh. He saw new realities and possibilities in his life. He saw the love and the freedom of God present in Jesus' compassion and the power of that compassion to heal. The Samaritan returned to Jesus and centered this new life on the giver of the gift because his healing was more than skin deep. God, through Jesus Christ, restored the Samaritan to wholeness and made something beautiful of his life. And so it can be with us. Amen. I invite you now to turn and let's join in a prayer of confession because, as I said, we have all fallen short of living as Christ wants us to live with joy and gratitude. Let us pray our prayer of confession. Patient Lord, you know how easy it is for us to whine and complain bitterly about all those things in our lives that are difficult. We focus on them as though they were the only things that ever happened to us, forgetting the many blessings that you have given to us and the opportunities you give us to serve you. We feel alienated. You call us beloved. We feel lost. You seek us. We feel broken and battered. Your love is a healing balm. Forgive us when we forget those things. Help us to always look to you for our healing. And to return thanks to you by praise and serving others in your name. For we offer this prayer of confession of our failures and gratitude for your blessings. Amen. Turn again to the Lord, for you are beloved and have been given many blessings. Rejoice in God's love for you. Amen. And now let us sing something beautiful because we have been forgiven and God makes something beautiful of our lives. You have made something beautiful of our lives, the ways in which you have healed and restored us. There have been countless times when we wondered if the trials and struggles of our lives would overcome us and swallow us up. And yet, O oh God, you have reached out to us through Jesus to redeem us. Just as in the scriptures when Jesus healed the ten lepers, one, when he saw that he had been rehealed, he returned to Jesus, praising God for the healing that had taken place. And we pray that our faith would be as strong as that of that one Samaritan. Give us the wisdom to know the source of our healing is not in our pleading, but in our acknowledging your love and power. 
as we bring before you the names and situations that are filled with strife and trouble, we ask for their healing as well. We lift up our prayers for Eddie and Paulette Welch, for the family of Bob Smalley, and for Susan Malinsky. We pray for Kenny Sawyer, Deb Philbrick, and the family of Sue Ryan. Lord, we know that you hear the cries of our hearts and respond always in love. Help us to place our complete trust in your never-ending compassion. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward?
may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now let us join hands and make a circle to sing.